Hello, everyone. Thank you for accessing this webinar. Um, we do want to really quickly let you all know that the topic for this webinar is about grief and um, how to find ways to deal with grief in a more healthy way. So we do want to let you know that throughout the presentation, we will be using words like death, dying, died, and this can trigger some uncomfortable feelings for some viewers. So we do want to let you know that it is okay to pause or to stop or to leave the presentation altogether. And on our website, we do have several resources listed for you that you can access in the event that you need additional support. Either way, we thank you for coming and for accessing this and for giving us additional opportunities to serve our community. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Maxine Henry. I am the project director for the National Hispanic and Latino Prevention Technology Transfer Center. With me today is Dr. Susie Villalobos, the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC project co-director. This session was originally recorded in Portuguese by our presenter, Fabricia Prado, and Priscila Giamassi, our PTTC program specialist. The original Portuguese transcript was translated by Priscila. So welcome to our Q&A follow-up. This is our presenter, Fabricia Prado. And this Q&A follow-up is on our talking about grief and COVID-19 in the Hispanic and Latin community, life experiences and therapeutic strategies from acceptance and commitment therapy. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to have you here with us. My name is Priscila Giamassi, and I work at the National Hispanic and Latino Prevention Technology Transfer Center. I'm here with Fabricia Prado, and we would like to follow up on some questions that were raised during an event that we both presented in July of this year. The event was titled Talking About Grief and COVID-19 in the Hispanic and Latin Community, Life Experiences and Therapeutic Strategies from Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. We had a lot of engagement and a lot of participation during the event and even extending a little bit of time during the live session we weren't able to cover all the questions that were asked by the participants. So our wonderful presenter has committed to follow up on the questions we were unable to answer during the live event. And we're here taking this opportunity to provide you with the answers. Thank you again, Fabricia, for your availability. Feel free to share a few words. Thank you so much for participating with me in this, Priscila. We are here to try to answer and talk a little bit deeper about these very interesting questions um, that the audience from the live event asked. In the end, Priscila will also explain our thoughts about your participation in this webinar and how important your participation was so that you feel like you are also part of this webinar together with us. Thank you, Fabricia. So again, the webinar was titled Talking About Grief and COVID-19 in the Hispanic and Latin Community, Life Experiences and Therapeutic Strategies from Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. It was originally presented by Fabricia, who is here with us, and I was the moderator and facilitator for this conversation. So let's start with the first question raised by Jacqueline Giamassi, my sister. I'm a nurse. At the beginning of the pandemic, I lost an aunt. She had all the symptoms of COVID-19. However, only eight days after her death, we received the cause of death, which was myocardial infarction. At the time, I didn't have the opportunity to say goodbye. She died in the emergency room where I worked. I provided direct assistance during all the resuscitation maneuvers that unfortunately were not successful. Exactly two weeks after this situation, I received a patient in the same condition and I had a crisis during the procedure. I had to be taken out of the emergency room because I could only cry because I couldn't treat the patient. Besides therapy, what would you advise for me to do to better deal with the loss that sometimes still hurts so much? Wow, uh, first of all, I wanna say I'm sorry for your loss of your dear aunt and for all the aunts listening here, please never underestimate your importance. Ants are fundamental, especially in our culture. Often ants are our second mothers or they are the people who buffers the effects of traumatic situations in our childhood when perhaps our parents could not be that person. 
In your case, you participated in two roles, as a niece and as a professional. And these are two different and combined grief processes. In therapy, you deal more with the traumatic aspects of your direct participation in resuscitation maneuvers, with maybe images, smells, words that you saw or heard and felt by being in this role. In your role as a professional and niece, you mentioned that you didn't have the opportunity to say goodbye, and this is a very complicated issue. And I think that it would be interesting to think about maybe creating a way to say goodbye to your aunt. It could be something supported by your therapy, but something between you and her. It could also be in a group, for instance, with your family. In addition to therapy, I like to think about the idea of support groups. Talking to coworkers who have already experienced losing a loved one in the emergency room, and also some self-care. I am always careful when I talk about self-care, though, because I don't want to give the impression that you just need to eat well, exercise, etc., and that everything will be okay. I do not want to minimize the complexity of the grieving process. But with that being said, self-care is a part of this, something that you can do to add to help you heal through the grieving process. But be aware of things like, did I stop doing the things I used to do that can help my well-being? Um, for instance, using self-compassion or being kind to yourself or recognizing everything that was out of your control as actually things that were out of your control. Maybe develop a new hobby or reconnect with someone that was helpful to you in the past or to something that was helpful to you in the past. If you have a religion or any type of spirituality, talk to your pastor, priest, um, or spiritual leader. Ask for reading references. You can look for specific prayers and religious or spiritual rituals that are intended for helping folks through the mourning process. If you're not religious, you can find symbolic ways to represent what it meant to you and how you want to create space in your life for it. For example, I mentioned during the live session that David Kessler says that our pain needs to be witnessed. And part of my interpretation of that statement is that pain must be externalized. I believe that a lot of internalized pain can actually make us sick. So one way to externalize is to have things visible for us, right? And the environments in which you live and work that express our grief, perhaps objects or images. Or if you prefer writing rather than using pictures, you can write to your aunt in a special diary made for that. You can decorate it however you like. And when you feel the need, you can write an entry. It could be as simple as, Dear Amps, today I can't stop thinking about you. It's hard to miss you. With love, your niece. Sometimes in therapy, you can identify a prevalent and recurring feeling, thought, or belief that is not very helpful to your grief process. So journaling can actually be a way to articulate thoughts and beliefs in a more complex way, um, avoiding extremes. For example, if you identify frustration and or powerlessness or guilt, and you see that you are kind of stuck in beliefs that are often distorted or false in regards to the narrative you created about what actually happened, such as the loss, the reflections you write in your journal can help you build more complex, less polarized narratives. Um, and that's what, you know, polarized means when we think all or nothing, or when we think in black and white, but instead giving balance about the reality that you lived and that you are trying to make a sense of. This can be done with the support of your therapist. During the live event, we have the opening slide with the images about grief. If you are more artistic, you can use only images or some other art form to externalize your feelings of the day. You will see those waves as we talked about in the live session. Priscilla mentioned that there will be days that you will feel something nice, affectionate, and happy. And then you're going to feel a wave of acceptance during that, right? And feel a lot of peace. Like Priscilla shared with us, well, today I am feeling fine. Tomorrow, I don't know. And then there are going to be other days when the pain is more present. Recognize that if this was a traumatic situation, if you experience something similar again, it is natural that it'll evoke these same feelings, especially at the beginning. And with time, self-reflection, externalization, finding spaces and places to express the pain, and to give meaning to it. The pain will come and go, and we can expect that pain will diminish or be non-existent, but maybe the process can be navigated with more lightness. 
We talked about the changing of seasons. Maybe each year the experience will be different for you. Amazing. Thank you, Fabricia. I feel privileged to be in the front row receiving this kind of guidance. Your answer came straight to my heart. The aunt mentioned by Jacqueline is my aunt too. Obviously, I didn't experience it in the same way with this level of trauma. I wasn't in Brazil and I'm not a professional in the field like my sister. But I really truly thank you for your guidance. I've been talking a lot with my aunt. I have been writing to her. I have been seeing her in birds and butterflies. Actually, yesterday I saw four monarch butterflies, which according to our culture, are a spiritual symbol of someone we love that passed away. But what I'm trying to say is that I've been dealing with my pain in different ways based on some of the things I learned from you. So thank you for your availability. Our next question was raised by Raquel Costa. Her question is, how can we approach the issue of death with children ages three to 10 years old? This question was raised by my mother. She has a bunch of grandkids, nephews, and nieces. I think she is trying to understand how she can teach and approach the topic of grief with them in a better way. Wow, that's a challenging question. Um, you mentioned she has a lot of grandkids. The way she raised the question, I imagine she has kids from ages three to 10 years old, and she is trying to find the best way to talk about you know, death and loss with, with children. Considering they are living in different stages of development due to their ages, how sweet and sensitive that she is trying to be aware of that. So I understand that your mother, by just asking this question as the grandma, I imagine that she must be an ideal person to be the person who will talk to these children. But if you don't think you are the right person to have this conversation, that is okay too. Please know you don't need to be good at everything all the time. Maybe this can be triggering to you. As long as you have another adult better prepared to talk to the children about it, being respectful, providing space to talk about their feelings without anxiety, helping them to deal with the issue in a calm and acceptable way. So first of all, are you the best person to talk to the children about it? If you are not, is someone else in your family? Or can you prepare yourself to have the conversation? You don't need to be perfect. It is okay to be vulnerable in front of children. But if you feel like it is too painful to you and you cannot talk about it yet, you can be honest with them. So this is the first thing I would say. Be kind and honest. It is important not to create makeup stories or I will talk to you later. Using a lie and carrying a lie for a few years. This can bring resentment and the child may internalize it as a problem with him or her. It is okay to use words like died and death because sometimes the euphemisms confuse the child and they start asking a lot of questions, which of course is fine too. But they can ask questions like, so they went to heaven? Where? Please show me, I wanna see it. And the children may want to know graphic and visual details about what you are sharing as a euphemism and they can be a little confused about it. So answering the questions raised by children is a good strategy to guide the conversation as they will be telling you what they are ready to talk about. If you don't have the answer to say, I don't know, if you don't have the answer, say, I don't know, I don't have that answer. Or, you know, I have a question, I had that question too, and create a healthy and creative way to explore the answer together with the child. Now, let's suppose the child asks, but where is this person who died now? This answer depends a lot on religious, cultural, spiritual, and or humanistic scientific beliefs. If this child or their parents already have a set of religious and spiritual beliefs because the child is part of some church, spiritual center, or something like that, you can answer within that realm, respecting the beliefs of the family and the child, and in general, instead of sharing something different from what the child is already being exposed to. There's also a way to answer the question and offering some relief, hope, or perspective of reunion. For example, this can be discussed. And if the child questions, it's okay. We believe that, or does your family believe that? So religion helps us to understand the finite portion of our existence. They offer an idea of afterlife, after death. Recycling, reincarnation, there is an expectation of something after that can bring some comfort to children. But be careful to not create anxiety. 
When is this going to happen? I want to see the person today. So children may have difficulty to understand long-term outcomes. Children before school age do not understand the concept of permanence, that death is something permanent, and they, they may insist that the person who died will come back, is sleeping or traveling or elsewhere. Um, and many cartoons and movies can reinforce that. It is good to reinforce to children that they are not to blame for events like this. It seems obvious, but for a child, it's not. The child may internalize as if he or she caused it. So it's important to emphasize this, talk openly about it. Another important thing is that a loss like this can create insecurity in the child. He or she might become afraid of losing everything or everyone who matters to him or her. What is fundamental for the child, and all that I am talking about is also important in situations of divorce, uh, which is a different type of loss, right? A different, um, a similar grieving process. I don't want, I don't want to talk about it, but I do want to make a parallel here. When we have a huge destabilization in the family, the child needs stability. If you are the adult, but are also suffering or grieving, if you can do one thing for this child is try to let him or her know that he or she is safe. Try to keep a stable routine in any way possible. Reassure this child that he or she is safe and that he or she can relax. We co-regulate our nervous system. So grandparents, for example, we have great power to help the child with their regulation. Grandparents are generally calmer, at least in my experience, um, but there are nervous grandparents too. But if you are a calm, understanding, compassionate grandmother, it is already a great help because as we co-regulate, if the child is tense, anxious, nervous, and their grandmother talks calmly, peacefully with them, then she will end up helping the child's nervous system to regulate itself. If one is calm and the other is tense, they will meet in the middle. It's like she's transmitting to the child her calmness, sometimes even without words, with a hug, a gesture, a handshake. It is possible to provide this comfort to the child. You are safe with me. I can hold you. If you are feeling very impacted by your own grief and cannot convey this security, um, be how to experience this for your child. Respect your process, your limitations, and communicate that it's been difficult for you too. Do not leave the child unaware of your experience. In my clinical experience, I realize that there is a trend in our Latin and Brazilian culture, and we need to be careful with this. Um, it's called emotional parentification. When everybody's falling apart, everybody's in bad shape, the child ends up taking care of the adults. Do you know that child, that children who looks like a mini adult emotionally, but speaks like an adult and has a high level of seriousness, a great sense of responsibility? I know many children like this. It is not saying that this in and of itself is bad. There are many children who are like this naturally, but sometimes it can be a matter of emotional parentification. It seems that our culture reinforces this sometimes, sees the child as brilliant, as a genius, a mini psychologist, and praises this aspect of the child quite often. Sometimes this child believes that he or she has found her or his role in the world and that they will embrace that. The ideal is that we allow the child to be a child while they are a child and to be aware that this emotional burden can bring anxiety and some other issue. So the adult needs to be the biggest person, um, not just in size. Sometimes it can serve as a motivation for you. For us, when we feel like we are falling apart, I might say, I have to be the biggest person here for these children. So let me adjust, readjust, strengthen myself so I can be the biggest person in the room for this child. Children can be very wise and give us life lessons many times. I don't want to discount that, but it's different when the child continuously actually takes on or is expected to take on the role of being the comforter, the conflict moderator, the family spokesperson, the little man of the house in a very serious way as if he or she were an adult. So if possible, be an example for the child on how to talk about this grieving process. Also, it is important to communicate with the school about what the child is going through. Maintain a routine. Communicate with the child about changes in case they have to move ha a house or move schools. It is important to keep them involved. Prepare them for what is coming. 
reassure the child that, you know, we're going to be okay, that I am your safe haven, and that we'll go through this together. So not as a way to blame our culture, but as a way that, you know, to just kind of prove that it is actually easy, even with the best intentions, it's easy for us to slip into this emotional parentification. And so even with these small steps, we can help to provide comfort and safe space um, while still being culturally appropriate based on what our families and um, our community believes in. Incredible. Thank you, Fabricia. You know, the way I talked about my mom was so exaggerated. It felt like she had a bunch of grandchildren. She actually only has two grandchildren, but she is a great aunt of five. So just like you said at the beginning about the importance of the four aunts in our culture, our family, and with that age range, I understand she's trying to better equip herself to talk about griefs with the kids she's close to. So thank you for your guidance. I learned a lot too. I thought it very interesting you mentioned that grandmothers are usually calm. Well, let me tell you, my mother as a mother was rigid and angry. My mother as a grandmother is a totally different person. So it makes a lot of sense. And I'm not generalizing, but also based on my experience, my mother is a personification of calm. That's one of the greatest mysteries of humanity. Why do mothers soften so much as grandmothers? What a question to answer, right? Oh yes, it'd be so interesting. Let's present a webinar about it, but I'm just joking. Next question was raised by Jacqueline. When we talk about grief, we often imagine that it is a process related only to death. However, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, many of us canceled or had to postpone some projects such as a trip or having a child. So how do we deal with these types of losses? Yeah, yeah, Jacqueline. Um, it is excellent to bring this perspective because we need to make this clear. Grief is not just about death. But there are many situations that are living losses, separations, divorces, you mentioned, and the type of losses caused by the pandemic, which are losses of dreams and ideals, losses of something that you had already created, that you somehow had mentally brought into existence. And then suddenly you have to cancel these plans, postpone them into the future, not knowing when, not knowing if it will ever be possible. This can be a type of unrecognized grief that we need to be sensitive and attentive to, validating the suffering and implications of these frustrated or suspended plans in our lives. This can, for example, increase anxiety, especially for those already experiencing anxiety before the pandemic. It can also bring despair. It can be difficult to replan. Sometimes it's not possible, possible to replan for some reason. I said a statement at the beginning of the event about who you were before the pandemic will shape you or who you are during the pandemic. And that includes how flexible you were to adjust to a change of plans. This can be very difficult for many people. So do you recognize yourself here? If you do, raise your hand, even if it's only to yourself because we can't see you from here, but there are a lot of people who don't like to change plans. Even sometimes when the change is for good, but just having the plans changed is complicated. Therefore, it is important to note this aspect. In some psychological disorders, such as obsessive compulsive disorder, or in other, you know, for instance, developmental disorders, um, people who are living with these oftentimes have great difficulty adjusting to change. Um, so for some children, they also face this difficulty. It's important to realize that what the pandemic is forcing on us may actually be harder for some people rather than others. And for people who have this problem of excessive self-control or psychological rigidity, the pandemic is very challenging. So it is important to be aware, to validate it, not judging it. Please don't judge others. Don't, oh, look, you're so stubborn, right? But it is also to really understand that this reality is experienced in different ways, depending on personality traits and also external factors such as social, cultural, financial factors. Several factors will influence how difficult or non-adjusting to these pandemic losses will be. We can also leave room to recognize the pandemic as a crisis that forces us to develop the muscle of psychological flexibility and to adopt a more complex perspective on life. Knowing how fragile we are and our plans and the little control we actually have over everything 
that we can live with that and increase our ability to be uncomfortable with uncertainty. It even feels like a spiritual journey, right? That we were forced to go through this to survive and in an awakening to a reality that has always been there, but our illusions of control and infinity have overshadowed them. We can be creative to deal with these losses and redesign our plans. We can be persevering. There is a quote from Clarice Lispector that I really like where she says, after every fight and every rest, I want to get up strong and ready like a new horse. That resilience that we're developing right now, whether we want to or not, because we're in survival mode, embrace hope about those plans, about the postponed trips. We can remain hopeful that we will readjust and help each other, or we can also dream different things because we are no longer the same. And I would also like to say that to manage anxiety about the future, it's important to be focused on the present and engage in anxiety reducing practices. And from the ACT perspective, uh, for those of you who haven't watched the live event, that is acceptance and commitment therapy. That means living in a life today that is aligned with what's important to you right now, to commit to actions that move you toward your values. We are fragile. We don't know what's to come. And by accepting that, we can live even better with less frantic efforts to hide and avoid the inevitable for ourselves and others. And why can't we live even better than before? This idea about the subjective meaning of time is very old. In Christianity, for many philosophers and religious authorities, biblical texts are full of messages about how to live without the anxiety of the uncertainties of the future. I studied a little bit of theology and also in my master's, I had classes in the science of religion department and in my master's thesis about religious values and spirituality and psychotherapy. My doctor, my mentor, sorry, Dr. Luke, and I published an article in a British journal in which we mentioned reflections from St. Augustine's Confessions on time and the idea of eternity, which exists above temporality. So strange as it is, it's interesting to think like this, because eternity exists above temporality, and eternity exists only in God, for which there is no past or future, and the only time that there is, is the present, and that this is beyond human comprehension, beyond our notion of temporality to be able to perceive. Our minds need time to be chronologic. Our minds need time to be um, chronological, but does eternity exist chronologically? Who knows? Isn't this a thing? The past is no longer here and the future is not yet. It hasn't happened. So I find it interesting that this idea that challenges our ability and recognizes that we are limited to understand certain things and accept that even if we cannot understand certain events, that we can accept them. And this is a real challenge. If you can accept it even without understanding, um, and for instance, maybe because you trust someone, or maybe in God, or in life, or in the universe, in something, in some force outside of yourself, and you trust that so much, even when you don't understand, well, then you can accept it. Yes, Fabricia, it makes me think about our conversations before the webinar, or with every meeting, new ideas come up and we are excited. Let's not forget to talk about this or that. Let's put that into the presentation. And now in this session, many new and important topics are coming to life. I just wanted to make an observation about what you mentioned. I even wrote it down. This experience of the pandemic has made us develop the muscle of psychological flexibility. I've been living abroad for three years, and the Priscilla at that time, if she thought I would spend two years without seeing her family and friends, would be like, nope, I'm not going, I'm staying right here. Of course, I'm talking in a lighter way, but even during this period, even though I didn't have a choice, it helped me to develop my resiliency and to think, wow, I can do this. Three years ago, this probably would have been impossible for even me to imagine. When I was forced, there was no other options. You have to outline your plans. I remember thinking of various worst case scenarios as if I didn't have enough money to travel or if I have a problem with my husband for some reason he couldn't travel, I don't know. But I always thought that I would figure it out. 
I would never think to add a pandemic to my worst case scenario list. And it did come unexpectedly. I'm glad I had my therapist supporting me for all those years. In my experience, considering that I suffer from high levels of anxiety, I think this was a fundamental success to my journey. It's beautiful to see that during this process of suffering, we can still manage to strengthen our resiliency, which is one of the strongest protective factors in our Latino Hispanic communities. Yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing that Priscilla. I do remember we talked about this and you talked about your frustration and there's something we call pro post-traumatic growth. Collective grief can be traumatic for many people. We don't want to emphasize this positive side because we want to validate that it is very difficult. But during the process, we can also develop something new, strengthen our resoluteness. Like, have we lost really everything? Or have we gained some things even though we've lost? Yes, exactly. Well, we have another question and it's raised by Lara Fernanda de Lima. And her question is, is there a difference between anticipated mourning or anticipa anticipatory grief? Um, I would say no. Uh, anticip anticipated grief, as Warden defines, it can also still be understood as the kind of grief that occurs before the actual loss of someone or something and has the characteristics and symptoms of the early stages of normal grief such as denial, numbness, yearning and protest, despair, depression, acceptance. This is what, for instance, the patient and his family experience from the moment a terminal diagnosis is announced, right? Since the announcement that there is a problem which threatens life, from the discovery of the disease to the death itself. This term was used especially for the grieving process experienced by the wives of soldiers who went to war and may never return. It was a kind of anticipated grief, a form of preparation for a possible loss, a possible death. Thanks, Fabricia. We have another question by Raquel Costa, kind of along the same lines. Is it easier to grieve the death when it's announced in advance? Can it be anticipated due to a terminal illness or for an abrupt death? Like it's happening now with the pandemic. Thanks for your question, Raquel. Interesting one. Um, obviously, no way is easy. We can think that if the person died, but it was a long illness process, um, for instance, when it was an el el elderly person, um, maybe the family was prepared. But that's not really how it is, right? The moment of death brings a reaction never evoked before, and it's not possible to prepare for it, as it will only happen at the time of death. However, we have to recognize that sudden losses and deaths, as you mentioned, what is happening with the pandemic can generate this state of shock on top of everything else as part of maybe maybe being longer in the stages of denial and anger because we need to overcome the shock. And even the notion of reality that escapes us with sudden deaths, the distrust we have and the great need to understand the circumstances of the death, the details and how sudden deaths arise from COVID can make us very confused because we're not with that person at the time of their death. Then it generates mistrust, sometimes even paranoia. What really happened? Who was there with the person at that moment, right? In these cases of hospitalization and death without witnesses, it can generate doubts and confusion and symptoms as they are usually traumatic. They can generate very typical post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, such as insomnia, nightmares, flashbacks, or images of what happened. So your question about the assumption that it would be more difficult to go through the grieving process in sudden death, I would say yes. These sudden deaths can be more traumatic and can be predictors of prolonged grief. Thank you for that answer, Fabricia. We have another question from Jacqueline Giamassi. Do the grieving processes necessarily take place in this order? Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance for everyone. And does this order always happen? Thanks for that question, Jacqueline. No, it might not happen in that order. Not everyone goes through all of these stages. In Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book released in 1969, um, she already talked about this, and many authors, specialists, and theorists always reinforce. Remember that these stages of grief are not linear. So what does that mean? 
This is what Priscilla commented about during the live event. This process comes like waves, comes and goes. You can be on the acceptance phase and go back to anger, for example. Therefore, they are not linear and not everyone will go through each of the stages in the order that they're typically listed. Grief is so complex. Imagine, for example, that a year or months after the loss of a family member, the family gathers to read the will and discover that the person who passed away left everything to only one person who has no ties of blood with the rest of the family. Imagine how this can move the stages of grief for people, right? Sometimes there are secrets that are revealed many years after a loss of a loved one, and this can also change the stage of grief that people are in. So it's important to be aware that these stages can be changed, will likely be changed, and we will have to learn, validate, and recognize these changes. I'm not suggesting that you watch anything, but there are some very famous TV series that focus on family, family dynamics, and grief. Let's assume that the father of the family died suddenly and tragically. And the series shows how the family has recognized or reorganized to live in that person's absence and how over the years you can see the characters come and go in these stages of grief. Amazing. I believe we can learn a lot from art. We can learn from other experiences from our colleagues and resources such as this live webinar we are making available to our communities. It's not easy, but here's our little contribution to help you through the process. So we have another question by Enriette Rodriguez Aquino da Silva. What if we don't have the feeling of mourning for your mother, which I believe that this pain should be so great that it cannot be compared? Maria, thank you so much for participating and sharing with us this incomparable pain of the loss of a mother, as you expressed it. I don't know if I understand it right. When you said you don't have a feeling of grief, I don't know if you mean not settling for the loss or in the sense of not feeling the loss. You asked what to do. So I think maybe curious, not judgmental, but trying to understand what makes it difficult to feel the feeling of loss. And this loss doesn't have to be felt in a specific way, nor is pain. You might even feel like relief. This can be very difficult for us. But for example, if you had a family member, even your own mother, that had been sick for many years, maybe it created a lot of stress, a lot of work, and a ton of fatigue. Or let's say you had a complicated history with this person, um, perhaps your mother, of trauma, abuse, neglect, or maybe even abandonment. Living the loss means recognizing that too. What if your grief experience um, and you feel relief or you feel anger. It doesn't have to be a feeling of longing, for example. Um, there's no such pressure to do that. So I would say that it would be interesting to have the curiosity to ask these questions to yourself. Or if there is a difficulty in feeling it, you may want to try getting in touch with it. Then it gets a little bit more complex and you will need support to do this from your support network, family and therapy to get in touch with these things. At the beginning of the original live event, I presented a slide showing factors that can influence your grieving process. The first is to understand that what this loss means to you, in particular, only to you, without comparing yourself to anyone else, because your experience with this person is yours. No one else has had the exact same experience. In its unique personal and social context, and this process will depend on very specific factors, such as when, where, and under which circumstances the loss occurred. How old were you when it happened? What stage of development were you in? How you interpreted this loss? If you or any of your sisters or aunts or godmother changed your roles within the family to fit the new system without, let's say, the loss of your mother, what implications did this bring on for you? For example, there are people who can be very resentful because a father passed away. Let's say the person was the oldest in the family and had to start working very early, take on responsibilities that he or she didn't want, for which he or she didn't feel prepared. Then this person feels angry at the father and even illogically, because feelings don't need to be logical, ask, why did you do this to me? Why did you leave me? Now I have to live this life that I didn't choose, that I didn't want with all of these extra responsibilities. So these things need to be observed. Your relationship with your mother, what kind of bond? What kind of attachment? Was it secure, insecure, anxious? All of this will influence how you experience grief. What kinds of things do you hear about your mother? 
from other family members, for instance? And how are other family members reacting to her loss? Do you compare your feelings with others? Do they have the same experience with her? Not possibly. Is there a need for forgiveness? Things that maybe were left unsaid? Some unresolved issues? In some, some ideas are joining a support group, having a support network, maybe therapeutic supports, books or self-help. Anything you can do to try to understand your reaction and understand with curiosity, but without judgment. These are some things to consider. Thank you, Fabricia. We have one last comment. It's from Miss Aquino da Silva. So it's very difficult to explain to your child when she hears the news all the time about COVID-19. And my daughter ended up testing positive. And I was careful when I started talking to her about it to stop having this anxiety and this fear of dying. Thanks again for your participation, Henriette. It is very good and important that you have been and are being sensitive to this need and fulfilling it by talking to your child. News are always dramatized narrative because they aim to gain and hold the public's attention, right? I would say that it is important to know the source of the news that has been seen and look for alternative sources that are more suitable for children. It is important that we read together something lighter, something about children, to create a dialogue with the child. Search for statistics on death cases in children due to COVID. Create a simple visual chart so she understands what it means, that the probability is very low, perhaps, or presenting the information to her in a very graphic way, meaning using pictures or illustrations. You can also compare with her things so she can see that the possibility of a child dying by COVID is more of a remote possibility and compare statistically with something like, have you ever seen this happen? And if not, you might be able to help her understand that the probability can be low. Maybe focus on resilience and strengths that the child has. For example, when she got sick and gets better, her body has already recovered before. Help the child understand that she can calm down and that she can count on your strength to help her get through this. Well, I'm not a kid anymore. And even the news is scary for me with regard to COVID. So part of my efforts to take care of my mental health was choosing the right sources of information for me. When I wanna have access to this information and educate other people, for example, sending messages on WhatsApp, have you seen how many deaths? No, I didn't. And I don't wanna know, please. Because even as an adult and with all the tools and educational information at my disposal, I still think it's frightening. So I can only imagine what it must feel like for a child to deal with this. And I think the tips that you shared were amazing. As I'm putting the slides back again, I just wanna thank Fabricio once again for her availability. I love having these conversations with you. I always learn a lot from you. I am very happy that we were able to answer and follow up the additional questions raised during the live event. You will be able to access these slides. We have only added a few because the entire presentation was previously provided and you can also access them on our website. If you have any questions, you can also contact us directly. We are here at your disposal. Fabricia also shared her contact information. Here is her email and her website. Before we move on to the last slide, would you like to add anything else, Fabricia? I just want to say that I also learned a lot from you, Priscilla, and also from the questions and engagement of the participants. To conclude our presentation, this is our, our idea as a way to thank each and every one of you for your participation and your contributions to our webinar. We've included the names of each person who attended our live event here to express our gratitude. We know you're all busy, tired, and probably Zoom fatigued, and you took the time to still join us and enrich our conversation. All of you bring us motivation, and we are building our Portuguese language training materials. So here's our big thank you. I won't read the names because I don't wanna miss anyone, but this is to show that all of you, along with Fabricia and I, have put the pieces together to build this webinar, especially this event you're watching right now. The entire session was created based on the questions you created. Thanks again for participating in the live event, for sharing questions, for being vulnerable, and sharing your personal experiences. Thank you for trusting us, for creating this safe space together to share experiences and support each other. 
See you. Thanks and bye.